Hello, everyone. So great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, as you know, we are uh, currently uh, hosting a video series for National Osteopathic Medicine Week. Super excited today to hear uh, from Hannah Tramontano, who will be uh, leading our discussion with Dr. John Beery. Uh, the specific topic will be uh, an osteopathic approach to sports medicine. I have an interest in sports medicine, so I'm very interested to hear about this topic, and I look forward to learning today. So Hannah, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, Isaiah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Hannah Tremontano. I'm Secretary and Recruitment Coordinator of the DO Advisory Board of American Medical Student Association. We're here to recognize National Osteopathic Medicine Week, or NOM Week, uh, we put together these talks just to give you guys some more insight on what the training and practice experience is like for GEO students and physicians. Today, uh, we have special guest, Dr. John C. Berry, who is uh, my osteopathic professor. He's board certified in family practice and osteopathic manipulation. And he has a certificate of added qualification in sports medicine. He's worked as a physician for the U.S. Navy, was deployed to Afghanistan, served as the team physician for the Naval Academy and Wounded Warrior Safe Harbor Program's Adaptive Athletics, served as the volunteer sports medicine physician for USA's Wrestling's 2019 Dave Schultz Memorial International Wrestling Tournament at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And he currently serves as a professor of osteopathic principles and practice at Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine. Thanks, Dr. Bear, for joining us today. Is there anything I missed that you'd like to add about yourself before we start the questions? No, that was very nice. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're just going to start off with some questions. First one, can you just start by telling us what influenced you to pursue osteopathic medicine? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great, great place to start. It's a great place I like to start when I talk to people about osteopathic uh, medicine. Um, I'm kind of one of those, um, I'm maybe a, a rare person in that when I grew up, I was surrounded by osteopathic physicians. I really only ever heard of an MD degree uh, when I saw something on television or when maybe it was in a book uh, because I was, uh, uh, I come from a family of osteopathic physicians, uh, uncles, uh, my dad, my grandfather, and uh, so, uh, and then all of, all of their practice partners were DOs, obviously, at that time. So I, um, I really didn't consider doing any other pr practice of medicine uh, because the osteopathic manipulative medicine piece was such an important part of their practice, um, doing family medicine, and uh, even my uncle, who's a, a gastroenterologist, still uses a fair amount of OMT in his practice and, uh, and has great success uh, with, with some of his patients that way. So it's, um, it's kind of been an interesting journey for me, but that's kind of how I became interested in osteopathic medicine is that it was, it's what we talked about at home. Okay. Um, so why did you specifically choose to specialize in family medicine, sports medicine, and I guess you kind of answered why DO already, so. Yeah, yeah no, I, um, I guess, you know, my, like I said, my dad uh, was a family physician and, uh, but he really would have been more appropriately termed a general practitioner, the same with my grandfather. Um, they both were trained and then they only had to do uh, their first year of postgraduate work. And so they just had their internship year and so they, they went and they worked very hard at the hospital, their internship year, and then they went out into general practice and, and took care of, you know, everything. Um, my dad delivered babies. He uh, scrubbed on surgeries. He covered patients in the ICU. I remember rounding with him as a kid and uh, at the hospital and watching him write notes or sitting in the doctor's lounge waiting for him to finish, uh, you know, uh, writing notes and rounding on patients. And then he had a very, very large component of his practice was sports medicine. He was, uh, when he was a, a medical student, believe it or not, he got himself connected with the Kansas City Chiefs and he actually traveled with the pro football team uh, for like the 71, two and three seasons. 
And so he learned sports medicine from the athletic trainers and from the orthopedic surgeons and the generalists that worked with the pro football teams um, while he was a medical student. Can you imagine doing that now? I can't, you know, looking at the volume of studying that you have to do. Um, I think in the early 70s, it, it, you know, it, it was a different, if it was a different time, you know, there was less, uh, there was less handholding and there was a lot more, well, you can do that as long as you get all your work done type of thing. At least that's what he's told me. And so, so he learned sports medicine from, you know, these really high level athletes and high level uh, medical practitioners that were, were taking care of uh, this pro football team. And then he's worked with universities and other professional sports since then. And so, um, you know, growing up in a small town, the only doctors that we ever really had exposure to were family doctors. And so that was really the only thing that I thought was reasonable. Plus, I like a little bit of everything. And that's what family medicine is. And so I, I had a great time. I loved it. It was, it was great fun. I did the residency. I did a ton of women's health. I scrubbed on surgeries. I, um, uh, I did procedures, uh, you know, flex cigs, colonoscopies, um, you know, all sorts of good stuff that I learned how to do as a family physician. And then, you know, I went in the Navy. I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the Navy still is a very generalist oriented organization because we put people on ships and you have to be able to do a lot of different things when you're basically on an island and you're the only medical provider. So you've gotta be able to do a little bit of everything and family medicine fits that bill quite nicely. And so uh, when I was stationed in Guam, I did, uh, I, I covered the ICU. I would you know, have six ventilated patients at a time as a family doctor. I would have patients on the floor. I mean, I, I took care of post thrombolyzed uh, ST segment MI patients um, in the ICU. And I took care of non-ST elevation MIs on the floor because we didn't have space in the ICU. Um, I, I scrubbed on C-sections and, um, you know, and, and you know, I consulted orthopedists and I consulted um, on general surgery cases when they needed a medical provider because we didn't have enough internists and we didn't have any critical care specialists. So. I got to do all those kind of fun things uh, and deliver babies, take care of newborns. So, I mean, I just, you know, it was great fun. And I think family medicine, the thing that I liked the most about family medicine is that you become part of a patient's family. They, t and, and you're kind of like the aunt that knows everything or the uncle that knows everything about the family because they tell you all their secrets. And so, you know, you have to be careful that you don't mention something when, when dad comes in, you know, that mom mentioned, uh, you know, made her upset. So it, it was a great fun to be that trusted member of somebody's family. But the, uh, the practice of family medicine is, is very challenging because it is so broad. And so when I had the opportunity to uh, do a sports medicine fellowship uh, in the Navy, I liked the, the, the way that practice was going. And quite honestly, I did it because I wanted to be a better musculoskeletal practitioner. I thought I needed to be able to communicate better with the orthopedics community. And I saw the sports medicine fellowship as a way to do that. I love watching college sports. I enjoyed covering college sports, but to be completely honest, I like musculoskeletal medicine the best. And that's really what sports medicine was able to do for me is to do is to, to get me into focusing on musculoskeletal medicine. And, uh, you know, I love fitness. I love, um, you know, overuse injuries. I, I like the chronic pain aspect of sports medicine, which a lot of people hate. If you talk to sports medicine doctors, they hate the fact that the only reason somebody comes to sports doctor most of the time is because they have a painful condition and they don't like the pain part of that. They wanna do the sports and the activity and what I found is that when I approached pain patients, so patients who would come to my pain clinic and they were, they were in the mindset of, of, of just manage the pain, I would treat them like I treated an athlete with the expectation that they would return to play. And it was amazing how positively they received that sports medicine approach to chronic pain in that you're gonna get back. We're gonna get you back in the game. We're gonna get you back in the game of life. And I had great success with some of these folks that had chronic pain by it, approaching them like I would approach a high level athlete. 
they appreciated it. You know, I acknowledged that they had pain, but I also said, you know, there's, there's potentially a, um, a mechanical cause for some of this. So we would use osteopathic manipulative medicine. I've also been trained in medical acupuncture and, and then I do joint injections and other soft tissue injections. So we were able to do a lot of things to their body to help alleviate pain that uh, a prescription can't do, uh, a simple corrective exercise can't do, uh, but I used medication and corrective exercises in combination with manual techniques and we had great success. And, and so that's kind of what's, what's propelled me in, in from family medicine to sports medicine to now musculoskeletal medicine. And um, without my osteopathic training, I, I don't think I would, I would be limited to doing injections. And then I would have had to sought additional training to do manual medicine, which a lot of my colleagues who um, are MDs that do sports medicine, the guys I've worked with that are primary care sports, a lot of them have additional training in certain manual techniques, you know, high, high volume things, high volume complaints. They've learned how to do certain techniques, whether it's from physical therapists, whether it's from DOs, whether it's from um, other people that do manual medicine, but a lot of folks do some manual techniques because they just work so well. So that's kind of where I'm at. So do you think that being a DO influenced you going into practice sports medicine? And how did you get on the Olympic network of doctors? So yeah, actually being a DO did influence my decision to go into sports medicine, but it's not maybe how you might think. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I, I felt very comfortable with osteopathic terminology and understanding the things, the way that the osteopathic profession describes musculoskeletal problem. But I felt really kind of, uh, I, I was uncomfortable with, you know, the standard orthopedic type uh, conversation. And so I really wanted to do the ad additional training so that I could speak to the orthopedist in a little more meaningful fashion, which, which turns out that was a good thing because just knowing how to do a Lachman exam or just understanding what a, um, a Job's empty can test is, that's kind of superficial. So just knowing those test names is not really enough to truly communicate or even really to truly um, make a make an honest to goodness, a, a really good decision on whether you refer somebody to orthopedics, whether you refer somebody to physical therapy or whether you manage it yourself with um, an injection. So, so I was glad I did the fellowship in sports medicine because I think it, it bolstered all of that knowledge. And then, uh, and so as opposed to what, you know, some people might think is that I, I, I was really good at musculoskeletal and therefore I did sports medicine it was more because I really wanted to be able to broaden my, my perspective and open that up to being able to communicate with everybody who works in the musculoskeletal uh, community. And then, uh, you know, how did I get involved with the Olympic network? Believe it or not, it's, it's simply asking the Olympic training committee to, uh, you know, to have me come out as a volunteer. There's a, uh, there's a volunteer application that you can get on the, uh, um, Olympic Training Center website, um, and you fill out fill out the form. You send it to uh, an athletic trainer out there who runs the, the volunteer program, and um, and she coordinates all the physicians who come out to volunteer. She call, coordinates all the PTs, the athletic trainers, the uh, chiropractors, the massage therapists, um, everybody in musculoskeletal medicine that is and sports medicine that would like to be involved with the Olympic program. Uh, goes through that that uh, through that coordinator, and so they do a little um, they do a little uh, maybe a little phone call and you talk to them a little bit. But you send your CV, you send all your all your documents, and then when they select you to come out, you have to do some training. Uh, there's a program called Safe Sport that's um, um, you know that they they have now that it goes through all the rules for what you can do when talking with athletes and you know supervision with athletes. You know, unfortunately, because of some some bad things that have happened in the past, where uh, physicians have taken advantage of their position, uh, their their uh, you know, and and of the privacy that they that patients provide them, and so they've created a, a very good uh, 
system of training and a system of rules that you have to follow when, when interacting with these athletes uh, for the protection of not only the athlete, but yourself, you know, as a physician, you, you have to protect yourself as well from um, accusations of uh, impropriety. So they actually help everybody. And then everybody walks in with the same expectations of professionalism and, and, um, and a spirit of cooperation. So that was really good. And then there's some other training on um, doping and, and those kind of things, uh, the use of medications in, in international athletes that you have to do. So once you do all of that, they schedule you to come out and you, you go out for a two week session where as the physician, you're sort of the senior person that, that of the volunteers um, and you're on call the whole time. And you, um, if they have, uh, if they have an injury or something, they ask you to go look at it first and, and you help the athletic trainers. You, um, if there's a medical problem, then I, I took care of the medical problems. And, and so those were a lot of fun. It was, it was an excellent experience. And then once you volunteer, then you go into their pool of people that they, they know and they may call you to come back and volunteer for something else. And then the, uh, and then the individual, um, regulatory bodies for each sport tends to manage their own teams um, and their physicians. So, you know, going to the Olympic training center is one route to participating with the Olympic uh, in the Olympics and then working with other um, governing bodies also is, is another way that you can work your way in there. Uh, so I work with the, or my name's in the pool for the, um, uh, for USA wrestling, but I've not yet been called to uh, get involved with that, but I've got friends who do that. So it's kind of fun to, fun to see. Um, and as someone who's been teaching students and fellows, what are some of the things you look for from students on their clerkship rotations? Well, I look, obviously we look, we all look for punctuality and, and uh, professional dress and, um, and bring in some questions being engaged, even if it's not something that you want to do, um, say you have zero, you, you want to be a, a psychiatrist and you have no absolute interest in, um, uh, you know, orthopedic injuries, but gosh, darn it. It's it, if you come and you say, well, can you tell me a little more about that pathology or, you know, Hey, Dr. Berry, is there a way I can, you know, what should I read? So I can understand a little bit more about that particular injury situation um, I don't know whether I'll need that, but gosh, it might be good for me to know in the future because every patient has a component of occupational medicine to it. And so uh, I'm seeing them for, uh, you know, depression or anxiety or, or even, uh, you know, something more difficult to um, take care of. Um, if I understand that they're a high level athlete, now I understand maybe some of their, their pain issues too. And then I can have an even easier conversation with my um, subspecialty colleagues. So I think having that openness to learn as much as you can possibly learn when you're on a rotation and show, show true interest in the rotation that you're on, even if it's not something that you think you really want to do in the future, but this may be your only opportunity to work with a nephrologist or to work with a pulmonologist or to work with a psychiatrist. And so you may never get a real chance to do that again. So, you know, try to learn as much as you possibly can from those people. Ask questions, ask questions about their career, about their life, about, you know, you know, don't necessarily ask them how much they made last year. That, that might be a little too, too close, but, you know, ask them, ask them how they made their decision on specialty, where they did their residency. Would they go there again? Did they, uh, you know, did they like the community? Um, what do they like about, the place that they're at now, even, you know, what advice do you have on negotiating contracts, those kind of things, if they're employed physicians, if they own their own practice, ask them a little bit about what it's like owning their own practice. And, and, you know, so all of those things, not just the medicine, as a student, you want to focus on the medicine, but if your attending or your preceptor is open, you know, ask the questions about life, ask those things that make make life possible. And so those are the kind of things, um, you know, the things that you don't like to see are somebody who's, who stands back or if there's another patient that walks in and they kind of disappear, you don't like the disappearing person. 
if you've already seen your quota, whatever, if there's four students on the rotation and everybody's supposed to see four patients in the day and, and, there, and there's an opportunity to see the fifth, be the one to jump on that fifth. It's not brown nosing. Your peers might think it's brown nosing, but it's not. It's just showing interest. And, and it will be reflected in your, in your evaluation. I mean, if you're always the person that jumps up and grabs that next patient, even if you're not right, even if you can't answer all your attendings questions, there were many times where I simply answered, I don't know. And, uh, and they res that most of the attendings respected the fact that I didn't know the answer and I'd be willing to, and then I was willing to go look it up. And then I had my article or whatever the next morning ready to go. So, you know, those are the things that you want to look, that you want to be, you want to be the go-getter, you want to be interested, but be genuinely interested because gosh, this is the only time you're going to be in medical school. And this is the only time you're going to have no res no real responsibility, but yet you're going to have exposure to incredibly cool things. And so be interested, be involved, you know, push the hour limit just a little bit. I mean, if they say you're only allowed to work 80 hours a week, be just, you know, be at that 80, 59, you know, don't, don't, uh, you know, be the, be the one that, because, because you'll never get these, some of these opportunities again, especially to, depending on the specialty you go in and, and depending on the environment you go into for training. Because if you go to a small community hospital, you know, a lot of times the really cool stuff or the really difficult patients, they make it into the emergency room and then they get transferred to a bigger hospital. And so you may not actually get to see those complex patients in your primary training environment. And, uh, but now as a student, you know, you're walking into, you know, big university, hospital, wherever, and you're working with residents, you're working with, you know, uh, attendings who've seen lots of neat stuff. And so you're going to get to learn a lot by osmosis. And uh, oftentimes, you know, in, you'll get to actually be the one who helps. If, if you're always the helper, oftentimes that's rewarded by opportunities. And do you have any remarkable patient experiences with OMM that you'd like to talk about? Gosh, I'm trying to think of any one particular patient that, um, well, actually, yeah, we, we've got, we had a great one that came in um, actually to our, our clinic that's associated with the school. Um, and he had a very, very common low back pain kind of complaint. He had been, you know, and it had been in, he had had this discomfort for, I don't know, four months. And, um, you know, a couple of the students went in, they evaluated and they said, hey, I think it's a piriformis syndrome on one side. And I think the, uh, he's got a iliopsoas syndrome on the uh, iliopsoas contracture on the other side, which is extremely common presentation for low back pain. Um, and based on the story that the patient patient relayed, that absolutely sounded like what was going on. So we went back in, we checked it, we treated the piriformis with, uh, with a very simple uh, approach using counter strain, which, you know, is very easy to use. And then we, uh, and we used, and we treated the iliopsoas uh, with counter strain as well. Uh, the guy stood up off the table and had uh, about 98% pain relief. And it was, it was like, wow, two very simple techniques. And then we, you know, we kind of cleaned up a couple of other little tender points that he had in his, um, in his tensor fascia lata and his glute medius, which are very common, you know, in uh, patients who sit a lot. And so we, you know, we, we treated those things. And then when we called him about a week later, because he missed, he couldn't come in, he, he couldn't get a ride or his, his vehicle was out. So we called him a week later and he says, oh yeah, no, my, my back and my butt pain are completely gone. Um, he had a couple other things that we wanted to work on too, but um, we didn't, uh, he wasn't, he, we haven't been able to see him again, thanks to the, the COVID-19. Um, we, we've had to suspend that, that, um, that student rotation. But I mean, that was a phenomenally cool thing that, you know, it, uh, it, it worked like that quick and it was students that did it. It wasn't me, I didn't even touch the guy. I just stood there and kind of said, yeah, try it. And they did. 
Um, and then I probably one of the ones that was the coolest for me was when I was a when I was an intern, believe it or not, one of my office mate, who is a, uh, he's an MD and his wife is a physical therapist. She came in with a with a case of vertigo, and um, my attending uh, saw her and prescribed some antivert and um, everything was fine neurologically. So they sent her down and on the way down to the pharmacy, um, my friend says, tells me what they're there for. And I said, oh, well, let me try the, uh, let me try this manipulation. And, uh, and you know, I was new to this whole thing. I'd only been doing it a couple of years other than what I experienced myself. So we tried a couple of techniques, very simple techniques. Um, I, I loosened up her back and her neck. And, and then I did a, what, what's called a suboccipital release very, very quick uh, technique. And uh, she sat up off the table, no change. Yeah, okay, no harm, no foul. Um, the next morning, my buddy comes in, we share an office and he says, oh yeah, by the time she got home, the dizziness was gone. She didn't, she hasn't had to take any of the medicine. And, um, and then as far as I know to this day, which is 22, 22 almost 23 years later, I, I'm not sure that she's ever had a problem with that again. Um, and so it was kind of, kind of a cool, cool thing. It may have been just a transient, uh, um, you know, eustachian tube dysfunction. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure what was going on, but we, we treated everything and, um, and she felt much better. And then I've, I've had that kind of success with vertigo, um, you know, uh, BPPV and some of the patients I had, um, uh, our ear, nose and throat doctor in Guam would send the BPPV folks to me. And uh, we had pretty good success treating that with, um, with a little bit of OMT. But, uh, and then there, I'm, I'm sure there's others. I just can't think of any really great uh, stuff, but it's, it is pretty cool. Cause I've, I've had, I, I guess I've had so many patients who've been treated for years with medication or something. And then with either one or two OMT treatments, they've, uh, they haven't needed the medicine anymore. And, and they, uh, a lot of times, even if they don't completely get better, um, they, uh, they're just appreciative that there might be a, a, a solution. Yeah. Actually, I do have one more that, I, that now that I'm thinking about it, that was really, really a super cool one. Uh, it was a terrible situation. Um, and this kind of alludes to the whole mind-body connection and pain and musculoskeletal problems. I had a, a woman who had been assaulted and, uh, you know, she had not, not been, uh, you know, she had not been uh, completely violated, uh, but she had been groped by her boss. And, um, and then she went through the, the horrific experience of making a report and then being devalued by her employer. And, and finally, it all worked out in court but she also had been in a couple motor vehicle accidents at the same time, which, you know, that doesn't make you feel any better. So she came to me after several years of neck pain um, and, uh, and she had kind of an ulnar neuropathy picture in, uh, I forget which arm, but there was nothing confusing or surprising about her complaint. I mean, if you've been assaulted and you've been rear-ended in a car accident multiple times, and then you have pain that is in your, you know, little, the, the ring and the little finger, and then you, uh, uh, you have pain that comes down to your elbow. It's, it's pretty, pretty, um, uh, it's not at all unreasonable to say it was uh, ulnar neuropathy. And then, you know, she had a little cervical spine dysfunction. And so um, we talked about it. I acknowledged that her pain was real because people had started to tell her that her pain was all in her head that there was nothing wrong with her, that it was just psychosomatic. I said, well, you were in how many car accidents and you've got pain in your finger. That's all very, very diagnosable. So we made those diagnoses for her, which helped her. And then I acknowledged her that it's totally reasonable if you've been assaulted and in car accidents and then you, your coworkers have basically uh, you know, you know, abused you after the fact because you reported this, um, it's very reasonable that you would feel down about that and feel unhappy and be upset. And so with acknowledgement, and then I, I, you know, I cheated a little bit, I used some acupuncture and that knocked down the pain almost immediately. 
on the first visit. So the second visit, she came back. She was a much different person. Her pain was back, but she had hope. And that was a huge difference. Having hope versus not having hope. And that's that mind-body connection that, that's so amazingly important. And um, certainly something that osteopathic medicine has been, been talking about the entirety of its existence. It's a very, very common contemporary theme in medicine, but it's been something that's been talked about for ages in um, osteopathic medicine. And so, you know, that's been, that was exciting. And then, you know, so then I treated her again with acupuncture. At this time I added manipulative medicine. And then the third visit, she came back. I again treated her with a little bit of acupuncture and some OMT. And then, uh, but, but just from the first visit, literally she was wearing all black and she looked very closed in. The third visit still had some black on, but she had a lot of color. She had makeup, her hair was, was, was done. She looked like a woman who was ready to go out and tackle the world again, as opposed to a woman who was defeated and beaten down. And so the combination of acknowledging that she was having trouble, acknowledging that she had a physical problem that could be addressed, and then addressing it by a couple of different manual techniques, um, you know, she was just totally turned around and then, then I never saw her again. So um, as far as I know, she uh, was, uh, all of her was resolved and she was uh, back doing her, uh, back to work and doing her thing. So th those, were, those were a couple of the really, really cool opportunities or experiences I've had with manipulative medicine in my musculoskeletal practice. Uh, what advice would you give to pre-med students who are looking at applying to DO schools but hesitant because they don't know any DOs? Well, I would say look inside yourself and decide what you want to do. Um, if you want to, um, if, if you have a proclivity towards manual medicine or musculoskeletal medicine, but you want to be able to practice medicine completely, then osteopathic medicine is a great way to go uh, because you learn the manual medicine as well as you have the ability to do injections, to write prescriptions, to scrub on the surgeries. If you want to go on and, and do an orthopedics residency, there are opportunities to do that. If you want to uh, go on and do other residencies, the opportunities are there. And I think uh, I, I think the merger between the osteopathic and the allopathic uh, residency programs, I think that's going to turn out to be, um, to open some doors that may have been closed in the past. Um, it may take a few years, but I really think that that's going to be, uh, become a, a positive thing for, for DOs. I don't think that we're going to see quite as many barriers to certain residency fields in the future. I mean, only time's going to tell, but um, certainly in the past, there were some barriers uh, that were in place for osteopathic residents, and, and that's why the osteopathic profession developed its own residency programs to ensure that if you wanted to be a general surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, that you could. Um, and now that we all have one, one training pipeline, um, I think that's going to even out, and people are going to have the opportunity to do things they want to do. Um, I think the last couple of years at our school, we've had folks who gotten into pretty much everything that that's out there that they've wanted to. I don't think there was any one place or one particular specialty that, that was, was such an obstacle that nobody could get into. So I, I think if they want, if they like a philosophically based um, uh, practice or at least a component practice, um, then you know, they should look at osteopathic medicine. There's a rich history um, it's not nearly as long, obviously, of a history as um, allopathic medicine. There's some uh, wonderful, wonderful things in the, in the global house of medicine that are fun to be part of as a physician. Um, but there's some really, really cool things that you can, uh, can do and be exposed to by going to osteopathic medical school. Um, and so I would, I would encourage people to explore all of the options. Um, the education is virtually the same. The, uh, the first two years, I mean, uh, everybody learns pathology. Um, everybody, there's a couple different textbooks from, that are pathology texts. There's a, a couple of different physiology books that are out there. Uh, there's a couple of different anatomy books that people use, but, but uh, you know, anatomy is anatomy. Um, 
physiology is physiology. Um, uh, we call it molecular medicine, which is a com compilation of uh, biochemistry, uh, immunology, um, you know, all sorts of, you know, the, the good, fun, little details that um, make medical school fun, right? <laughs> right, Hannah? That, that, that yeah. class makes everybody laugh and smile. It's so much fun to learn all that detail. But all that detail is wonderful because it, 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 it informs you as to how the whole works. And, uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, you have to be able to figure out eventually is how do all these details add up to the whole? It's not a complete picture, but, uh, but basically your first two years of medical school are spending a lot of time learning details and, um, and trying to draw those correlations with the whole. And then the third and fourth year are to see the whole and then reach back to those details and, and further cement your understanding of how the body works, how it goes wrong, and how you can uh, make an intervention to, um, to try to help that person heal. And, and I think there's, there's tons of opportunity in all aspects of medicine to go beyond the, the, the simplistic approach that we use in the beginning couple of years of medicine. But I don't think there's a way you can start complex um, you, you have to start with the building blocks so that you can build your foundation and then you can build your fancy house. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't get those basic building blocks and those are gonna be provided in all medical schools, uh, no matter where you might go to medical school, those basic building blocks are provided. Um, and uh, and that's, that's what you need out of medical school. When you get into residency, you get into the more, more of the detail that you need to practice in that specialty. And then once you're in practice for a few years, you really get to know what you need to do uh, to be successful in your specialty. And then some folks will go on and do additional training uh, in a fellowship or in a second residency to try to really round out what they need to be uh, successful in the area of practice that they, uh, they would like to do. Um, so I would not be hesitant to look at all schools, um, look at, regions that you like to, you'd like to live and um, because you're gonna get the basic building blocks. Obviously I have a preference towards osteopathic medicine since I'm a, a, I'm a DO and I come from a family of DOs. I, I think the manipulative medicine uh, makes, makes you, uh, it, it gives you another avenue to help people. And, and that's what I like. I like that, that piece of osteopathic medicine. I think that, um learning OPP and anatomy at the same time helps you remember anatomy too, or it helps me remember anatomy. I think, um, I think right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how often do you incorporate OMM into your practice? Well, in my, uh, you know, I had a couple of different practice environments. When I was a family physician, I, I would say, you know, I probably would do 25 to 30, some days 50% of my, my clinical time, my clinic time was uh, incorporated osteopathic manipulative medicine into my practice. And, you know, there were other patients who came in and they were there for a med refill. They were there for a, a consultation with somebody else or, you know, things that, you know, they were quick visits and you didn't necessarily pull out all the, all the tools that you might bring if you were just looking at somebody for the first time, but, but the plan had already been established and, and you were simply helping the patient fill out that or, or fulfill that plan. So that didn't always necessarily lend itself to using manipulative medicine. So, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50%, I suppose there were some days where I did more OMT than that in my practice. Um, and then when I got into sports medicine, I don't know. I, I would say, a, you know, a slow day on the OMT front would have probably been about 25 to, to 50%. But then there were many days where um, it was almost 100% of my musculoskeletal patients received some, some treatment of some sort or where I used some technique uh, in the diagnostic process that just helped me sort out whether I needed to have them go see an orthopedist or whether I could take care of it myself or whether I... Um, they would benefit from seeing a physical therapist for a more prolonged uh, course of rehabilitation. So, I mean, I, I and then when I was in my, my, and, and when I was working the pain practice, it was almost a hundred percent. 
um, oftentimes they would come because I, they knew I did acupuncture. But when I really saw them, I was like, OMT would work much better for this than acupuncture. So I would treat with OMT and then I would often combine the two and have really, really good success. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some questions from the live chat too. So I'm gonna ask some of those. Cool. Um, so one student asked, how hard was it to get into sports medicine? They are an athlete and it's a passion of theirs. Well, I mean, you have to define sports medicine. I am a family physician and I did a primary care sports medicine fellowship. Um, I also have to further subdivide that and say I was in the Navy at the time when I did the training because we have a, a, a fellowship in the Navy and then there's a tri-service fellowship that's in DC. So, you know, we have about um, anywhere from five to six sports medicine spots in the military that are just for military. But um, so, you know, the, the, source, the source residencies typically for primary care sports medicine are uh, pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine is probably the biggest one, uh, physical medicine, rehab, and emergency medicine. All of those communities have sort of focused uh, sports programs, but I would say the majority are family medicine type primarily uh, programs where they're taking family doctors and running them through a year of additional training. And, um, you know, at least that's my, my impression looking at the people that are out there. So it, it's, it's, you know, primary care sports uh, on the osteopathic side, you can do um, osteopathic manipulative medicine residency and then add a sports medicine residency on there too. So that's, uh, that's another primary approach. Now within orthopedics, there is a sports medicine fellowship that you can do after you're an orthopedic surgeon that tends to be in a place like, you know, Rush uh, there in Chicago. That is a huge uh, fellowship program. They do tons of research that that group covers a bunch of people, a bunch of the pro sports in Chicago. One of my partners trained there. It was, it was a phenomenally good experience for them, for him to be there. Um, he was busy, busy, busy. And he learned a ton and he's really, you know, you go there to become even more expert at shoulder and knees. Now you do everything when you're an orthopedist, but if you're a sports ortho, often your practice is heavily, heavily, uh, you know, surrounding knees and shoulders, but you're still going to do ankles because athletes injure their ankle. You're still going to do fractures. You're going to still do hands and wrists, but um, you know, you're, you're, you really spent a great deal of time working on, knees and shoulders. Uh, primary care sports, it's, it, it runs the gamut, depends on where you're at. Um, you know, our, I was involved with, uh, as faculty at the Naval Academy, which was part of the Uniform Services uh, University program. And so we had division one athletes and you know, we worked with surgeons, we worked with all kinds of people to gain that sports experience and, and covered, covered those sporting events. Um, my program out in California was very much a community-based program. We, we had high school athletes and we had military athletes. We didn't have so many um, university um, or pro athletes other than the military folks that were uh, on some of the uh, Olympic preparatory teams. Uh, but yet we, we became really, really good at taking care of overuse injuries and acute traumas from military training. So I think all the programs are really good. Uh, some of, most of them are, are small. There's one or two people typically in those primary care programs. Most of them are at universities so that you have that division one sports coverage. Um, everybody wants to get football in because that's where all the, the big injuries happen. And then, um, you know, if it's a big basketball school then you're gonna be heavily involved with basketball. Otherwise you could be hit and miss and just work in the training room. It's a lot of the sports that have so many games it's hard to be a fellow and travel to all those games and still do all of the requirements that are there to, uh, to meet your training requirements for the program. So, um, but uh, I think if you go and you, if you do primary care, getting into a primary care sports fellowship, especially as an athlete, a prior athlete, um, you're going to, you're going to probably not have too much trouble because you speak the language. Um, you understand a few things, but I'd also say you have to be willing to, break some of your own habits. Because remember the difference between a really good coach 
and uh, and a really good athlete is the coach knows how to t- how to uh, how to coach lots of different athletes, and a really good athlete know knows what work, works for them. So you got to, as a former athlete, you you have to be able to separate yourself a little bit from your own personal experience and biases, so that you can uh, uh, assess the patient and and uh, and the athlete and try to make the best recommendations for them. So I don't know. That was a long answer. So hopefully that was somewhat useful. Um. So we have an MD student saying that they've, yeah, right. Um, They've always wanted to learn OMM and they are asking if you know of a way for MD students uh, to learn more OMM so that they can help their patients as well. Absolutely. So there, there, there are several courses. There's uh, at the the New England College of Osteopathic Medicine up in Biddeford, Maine. They have a, they have a CME series that you can do. Um, the, the Michigan State's Osteopathic Medical School has a, a CME series that you can take um, to, to learn manual medicine. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of courses out there uh, that, that physical therapists and other, other practitioners, probably some other DOs that I'm unaware of, uh, have courses that you can take. You can always mentor with, uh, you, can, you can have a DO be your mentor. Uh, one of my, and, and then, and then another course, the American Academy of Osteopath- Osteopathy, the AAO has a, and if you Google it, you have to type in uh, the American Academy of Osteopathy. Otherwise you get the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I think if you just type AAO, there's probably more ophthalmologists than there are DOs who do nothing but manipulative medicine, but they, um, uh, so the, so that group also has a CME uh, course. Actually, it's coming up in a month. Um, at the end of, I want to say it's either the beginning of Ju- first week of June or the end of May, they're having their um, uh, basically OMT for MDs type of uh, lecture at um, at the American Academy Oste- Osteopathy's headquarters in Indianapolis. So those are some big ones that I know of. And then if you happen to go to a mixed program where faculty are both DOs and MDs, and if you've got a, a DO faculty member who does a lot of OMT, you can. You can you can just sign on and say, hey, what what can I do? What what will you show me how to do? I've got a friend who is uh, in the Navy. He was one of my he was a third year resident when I was an intern, so he's big influence on me. Uh, I think he went to uh, University of Miami for medical school and undergrad also at University of Miami. And um, uh, my daughter's going there, so go Canes, right? And uh, uh, so the um, he learned OMT from one of our faculty members, and um, he's still doing OMT in his practice. He still gets privileged at all the places that he goes to be able to do manipulative medicine. And many patients who were treated by my friend and our mentor, who was the one who taught him, actually prefer to be treated by uh, my friend. <laughs> so, so it's a case of where the student became the master. And uh, so it was, it, it is possible. Uh, there's plenty of MDs that are out and about that do nothing but manipulative medicine, believe it or not. Um, I've, I've uh, worked with a couple of those folks and I've talked with them about how they structure their practice, how they get paid, all those kind of things, um, because that's often a complaint or a concern uh, amongst MD faculty members who have DO students and DO residents, they're unsure how to get paid and so, you know, they're, they're less willing to do things that they don't get paid for, which is totally reasonable. Um, you know, why do you want to, why do you want to give away something um, that in any other business you would never give away, but yet because we're altruistic, we feel like we, we should give things to patients. Um, but that's not actually uh, reasonable. I mean, you, you work hard, you learn these things, you've spent a lot of time learning. And so, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't give things away for free unless you really want to. And there's plenty of opportunities to give uh, give your time and your treasure away, um, but if you can bill for it and the insurance company will pay for it, then why not, right? So, um, so hopefully that answers the question about where to get the training. But the American Academy of Osteopathy, the University of Mi- uh, uh, Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, if you look at their CME offerings, and then the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine in their CME functions, they also have some courses for uh, manipulative medicine for uh, allopathic physicians. 
uh, and then Hannah just threw up a question here on you know OMM and billing. That's an interesting discussion. A lot of it comes down to uh, making a diagnosis that you can that you can bill OMT for. Um, in our profession, we've uh, determined that the name of the of of the condition that we treat with osteopathic manipulative medicine is somatic dysfunction. And you're right, if you break that down, it means body dysfunction. Um, you know, it was a real rocket science moment when, when that, what, that term came up. I'll spare you the story, but I've heard it, it's pretty funny. Um, they, uh, but they, you know, so you have, and then it's billed by region. So if you have somatic dysfunction of the neck, of the thoracic spine, of the lumbar spine, of the hips, of the pelvis, of the legs, then you, you know, so you can, you can do multiple techniques on um, a particular region and you can only really bill for one, that one region once. So uh, there's, some, there's some constraints on the billing, but still you can make, um, you can make a, reasonable, um, a, a reasonable amount of money over top of your, um, your general E&M billing that you do. And then if you add an injection or something like that to it, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can add to your bottom line uh, significantly. And it, it really doesn't take a lot of extra time. We teach it like it's a subspecialty. And, um, and then a lot of people think that that's the only way that you can do it. But every family physician listens to hearts and lungs. Um, they've been taught the way a pulmonologist does it, but you learn, or a cardiologist does it, but then you learn how to uh, meet the minimums to be able to meet the billing requirements and to meet the medical necessity uh, you know, for primary care. And the same can be done for manipulative medicine. You can learn how to do it faster, make the diagnosis faster, do the billing, get paid for it, and still see you know, 20 to 25 patients in a day if you have to. Um, hopefully, if you bill for OMT, you only have to see um, 16 or 18 patients a day. And that makes everybody's life a lot easier. Patients are happier when you spend more time with them. Does that help? Yes. I, uh, I remember that lecture. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so the um, adaptive sports, um, that was fun. I got to work with the Navy's Wounded Warrior Program. And then um, because it was, um, you know, Prince Harry, who is um, no longer, uh, I guess, an official, he's a, still a royal, but not really with royal responsibilities. But anyway, he came with the British uh, contingent of British wounded warriors, and they came over and they went to our um, our military wounded uh, wounded warrior games, and they uh, and he said this, we need to do this for everybody who was involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we need to do this for all the coalition forces, and so he put together um, a, 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 an international adaptive athletics competition called the Invictus Games. And so I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time at the Navy's adaptive athletics uh, uh, team, uh, part of the Navy's Wounded Warrior Safe Harbor Program. And, um, and we went to London and we, com and we had our Wounded Warriors compete in the, uh, the Olympic venues. So the, the natatorium, the, you know, the, the basketball courts, the, the track, um, it, was, it was a phenomenally cool experience. And then uh, everybody came also then to Orlando and we did it again in Orlando. So we, uh, we had all these guys and gals from all over the world that we got to see. It was a lot of fun. We worked with the VA, we worked with um, all those things. And actually several of our athletes, some of our coaches and several of our former military people who'd been wounded in combat have gone on and competed in the Paralympics. Uh, there's two, uh, two people that I can think of, uh, three people, one who's a coach. She, uh, she's been a gold medal winner in uh, seated volleyball, women's seated volleyball. She's an Air Force veteran. Uh, there's a man who's a Navy veteran who uh, was on the men's seated volleyball team down in, um, uh, oh, why am I blanking? Uh, the last Summer Olympics, he was on that team. And then there's another woman who's a, a swimmer. And she's still part of the Paralympics team and she's still on active duty in the army. Just phenomenal people, phenomenal young people. Um, I had a fellow that you know, was, was seriously injured, a combat injury. And he 
was on the Navy's team. Uh, he was a corpsman and he had been injured badly when he was out with the Marines. So, I mean, great guy, fun guy, came and he participated in sport. It was a great way for him to reconnect with, uh, with other military people. And, uh, and that's really why we used it in the military. And so that was a lot of fun. And then I've seen, I've seen people that, you know, could have been or, or could have felt left out. Adaptive athletics has really allowed them to continue to feel part of it. Um, you know, wheelchair basketball, it's a, it's a, it's a thing, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, wheelchair rugby, a lot of fun. I mean, it is a big time sport in other countries and it is a lot of fun to watch people in wheelchairs go screaming down the court and smash into one another and, you know, love it. It's just like any other collision sport that you'd be playing and they're just, you know, out there, you know, can't walk or they've had a spinal cord injury, but they're actually able to compete and have, um, have a lot of fun. And, you know, everybody enjoys watching sport and, uh, I've been privileged to watch some really phenomenal amputees that are athletes um, and um, and help care for their musculoskeletal problems, and it's been um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your experience as being a DO in the Navy? Yeah, it was uh, it, being in the Navy was great. Uh, being in the working in the Department of Defense in the military was awesome because there was no. Um, Nobody cared where you went to school. Quite honestly, uh, they uh, you were you were you were valued or not valued based on the quality of your work. If you uh, if if you were a doof, uh, nobody wanted uh, anything to do with you. It didn't matter where you went to school. You could have uh, you know I know people who went to uh, very well known institutions, but they just you know they just weren't quite where you want them to be. And so they were, they were not the top dogs, even though by their pedigree, they should have been, right? But they were not. And then there were other people who were uh, from relatively no-named places, uh, whether that was an osteopathic school or whether that was a, you know, a, a, sm a smaller allopathic school that doesn't have you know, a huge reputation. Um, and they were the rock stars. They were the ones who everybody wanted to see. They were the ones who, um, you know, the, the faculty uh, recommended and who the faculty wanted to keep on board uh, when they were trying to pick who was going where. And, um, and as an osteopathic physician, you know, if I said, hey, I'd like to be able to use manipulative medicine, I had a, I had a, a mile long list of referrals for patients, you know, the, the MDs that were in our group, they didn't, they didn't see that as a, a problem. They were like, cool. I wish I would have, uh, I wish I knew that, how, how to do that. And, um, and actually I'm a little embarrassed to say that I, I didn't share as much as I probably could have um, because I didn't think I knew enough. You know, I'd never been a teacher. So I was a little afraid to try for fear that I would not do it right. Um, and now that I'm teaching, um, I, I realized that I probably should have been teaching a lot longer than I have been, you know, teaching my colleagues and, and offering those opportunities when, when people say, hey, I really wish I knew how to do this, I wish I would have tried a little harder to help them grow their skill set too, because, you know, these are all my friends and, um, but at the same time, it was okay because I got to see their patients and, uh, and we got to share patients and, um, you know, I got to know a lot more people because I was a consultant within the family medicine department. And so for me, it was a lot of fun to see all those patients. So I don't know, maybe it was a little selfishness that I enjoyed having that, uh, that skill set because I'd refer patients to my buddies who were better at, at putting in uh, Implanon or, or something like that, or, or doing vasectomies. I hate doing vasectomies. So I just assume send them to the, uh, those that love to stamp out fertility. I'm like, go for it. You can do that. I, um, I just don't, I don't care for that procedure. Um, but uh, so, so we shared patients. It was great. Uh, you know, everybody worked to the maximum of their skill sets. And, um, and so it was a very collaborative, um, non-punitive, you knew what everybody made because everybody's salary is public record. And so you, you, um, you know, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a great, it was a great collaborative work environment. Um, and, uh, and we, we had, it was a great place to work because I didn't have to worry about patients 
not having insurance, not being able to pick up their prescription, not being able to afford the copay to go see the general surgeon if they needed something or to see the dermatologist if I wasn't sure what was going on. So it was a wonderful environment to work in uh, from that perspective. It's, it's changing some now, but I think it's still a pretty good environment. And I think it's still very, very uh, friendly to all physicians who uh, are willing to work together. Um, so we're getting to the end here. Do you okay. have any last advice you want to give to medical students or any pre-med students? Uh, pre-med students, I would say try to get any, any shadowing opportunity you can. Um, if you're going to apply to an osteopathic school, it's awesome if you can find a DO to work with, um, especially if you can find somebody who's, who can demonstrate or who can at least talk about osteopathic manipulative medicine and how they might have used it, because that's, that is guaranteed to be a question in your interview is, have you ever seen this? You know, what do you know about it? Um, th there's lots of books. There's lots of references out there to read a little bit more about the history of osteopathic medicine. You know, some of the, some of the philosophical things that go into making the osteopathic philosophy. And those are, and I, Honestly, that almost is a, a universal thing that I think people truly come in. It's almost like a, it, it's, a written, it's a written group of words that sort of say altruism. And that's really what we're all looking for when we come in. And then, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, um, this machine we all um, have jumped into medicine um, sometimes strips that out of you um, as you're, you're going forward and you kind of forget that, um, but uh, you lose the forest for the trees of data and trees of information and knowledge. And you forget that at the other end, it's a patient and that patient piece is what we're all there for. And for students who are actually part of med school now, no matter where you're going, take every opportunity um, to learn something new. Even if you think you'll never do it again, you know, if there's a, if there's a, you know, a two page article or a three page article that somebody shows you, read through it, you know, take, take the two hours or take the hour to, to read through something, um, and you know, and if you and if you don't have a chance to do it, skim it so that you can at least you know become familiar with the terminology, so that if somebody's explaining something the next day um, or you know the next week, you know, take advantage of all those opportunities while you're young and relatively unattached. If if you're if you're not young and you're not unattached, but yet you're in the in the school environment. You know, realize that this is a this is a, a finite period of time that you have to maximize your educational opportunity. So, try to you, you've got an even harder time to balance with your if you've got a family, if you've got children, um, trying to balance that time. But but trying to still take advantage of the opportunities that your school, that your you know that your your university, your your hospital rotation site, things that you you could you may only see once. You know, when I went to Australia as a, you know, when I was in high school, I thought this is the only time I'm ever going to be there. I've been back a couple times since then. So it's, you never know, right? You never know. And, um, you know, I wish I would have spent more time learning about the ventilator. You know, fortunately for the last uh, uh, 15 years, I haven't had to do ventilators. So it turns out it wasn't such a bad thing that I missed out on some of those finer details. But, um, you know, you just never know when you're going to, need some weird piece of information that you pick up somewhere. So be a sponge, learn everything you can, um, try to figure out how you can practically apply it and, um, and just enjoy what you're doing. You worked very hard to get where you're at. And, and you know, so, so be happy that you're where you are because this is where you wanted to be. And, um, and you're gonna have a lot of fun, no matter what, no matter where you end up in medicine, that's where you're supposed to end up. And, you know, you, you're gonna be able to have fun and you're gonna help people in ways that you can't even imagine at this point in your life. It's a truly amazing, fulfilling privilege to be a doctor. And, um, and, if, and if you keep that wonder and enjoyment about yourself with, uh, with respect to practicing medicine, um, no matter what the insurance company says or no matter what the, your boss says, you know, you're going to always have fun when you're in with your patients. And that's the bottom line is taking care of patients and, um, and enjoying and learning as much as you possibly can. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Barry, for joining us and answering sure. all of our questions. 
And um, thank you to everyone who tuned in and asked questions as well. Good luck on your journey in medicine. And special thanks to the American Medical Student Association for allowing us to bring these events to you. And don't forget to join us for our last event of the week, which is tonight at 6 p.m. Central Time. And you can hear from fourth year medical students that matched into general surgery, family medicine, physical medicine and rehab, anesthesia and psychiatry. So thanks everyone, have a good day.